Um, Sandra Mills is presenting on patient-oriented discharge summaries. Uh, Sandra is the patient education and engagement lead at UHN Toronto Rehab Lindhurst Spinal Cord Rehabilitation Program. Sandra co-leads the Teach Back SCI patient-oriented discharge strategy, otherwise known as PODS, at Lindhurst. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, first of all, I want to thank Rebecca uh, and the organizing committee for the invitation to speak with you today. It's a pleasure to, to um, chat with all of my colleagues in Alberta uh, from Ontario. So thank you so much. And I hope that you guys have had a wonderful day today. I just was listening into that last conversation about FES and it's, it's fantastic. And I really enjoyed listening to that. So hopefully you get something out of this. I have been asked to speak with you today about uh, um, the initiative that we have here at Lindhurst in Toronto, it's called Teach Back Spinal Cord Injury. It's a patient-oriented discharge strategy. We affectionately call it PODS. Um, it really is a process for optimizing transitions from the inpatient program to the community. The other thing that I'm going to touch briefly on is exactly what Teach Back is um, so that you can use it in your clinical practice. So as we know, spinal cord injury is a complex, multi-system, life-altering condition. There are um, a lot of concerns when it comes to transition from rehab to the community. We know here at Lindhurst, and it's probably the same in Alberta, that when people leave the inpatient program, they often report falling off a cliff, not knowing where to go, who to talk to, um, and what resources are available for them. We know that hospital lengths of stay are shorter and the transitions between those phases of care are faster. So here at Lindhurst, what we did back in 2015 is uh, came into this program. It was the patient-oriented discharge summary. We changed the S to strategy because uh, as opposed to a piece of paper, our Teach Back SCI is really a discharge meeting that uses self-management and health literacy best practices that's led by a neutral clinician facilitator. So the neutral clinician facilitator is somebody who works here in the program but is not directly on that patient's care team. So it could be an outpatient physio, an outpatient OT, the speech language pathologist, somebody from our assistive devices program. Um, it could be a service coordinator, it could be myself. Uh, and so we are all neutral to that patient's care team. What that means is we don't have all of the history or backstory of that individual's experience in their rehabilitation program. The reason that we went with a neutral clinician facilitator is because when we were first demoing and piloting this project back in 2015, and we used uh, clinicians who were part of that care team, and when we were asking that patient to speak aloud what their care plan is for the first few weeks at home. Uh, so example would be, you know, tell me what your plan is for managing your care or pressure relieving strategies when you get home. If the patient wasn't able to teach back that stuff, what was often said by the clinician was, it's okay, I know that I taught you that, I know that you know it. So we never actually heard that patient speak aloud what they um, had learned in rehab, which means we don't know what their care plan is when they get home. When we moved to a neutral clinician facilitator model, we then were able to actually pull that information out of that patient by asking them nice big open-ended questions that got to what they had learned, what they know, what their care plan will be for those first few weeks at home. So now we have a situation where we've actually heard and listened to that individual talk aloud what their care plan is, and we're able to then identify gaps or opportunities for learning prior to that person being discharged. So this teach back meeting happens one week prior to discharge. We tried it two weeks before discharge and two days before discharge. And the reason that we settled on the one week is because if somebody was, um, if we had that meeting two weeks prior to discharge, 
their plan of care could change because their um, their functional ability was changing up to that one week time frame. Now things can still change between the pods meeting one week prior to discharge and the discharge date, but there's less likelihood of dramatic changes that uh, could take place. The reason that we didn't go with two days prior to discharge is because if there were significant gaps in learning or opportunities to enhance education prior to discharge, we found that that two week, two day time frame was not enough to get that information relayed to that patient. We know that discharge can be a very overwhelming period of time with a lot of information being thrown at that person. So we determined for our patient population here in Toronto that the optimal time frame was one week prior to discharge. At that meeting, the patient and or family member or support person for that individual is at the meeting, as well as the neutral facilitator and then a member of the team. So the team member who comes to that pods is almost a friendly face, right? There's somebody who is known to that patient because oftentimes the neutral facilitator doesn't know the patient. In fact, that's the way that we prefer it. So we want there to be a friendly face at the meeting that that patient can turn to for reassurance and guidance and assistance as they work through the responses to the questions. We often ask that team member to remain quiet throughout the meeting until they are invited into the meeting because we don't want them to respond to the patient when they say, I don't know. We want the, the neutral facilitator to pull information out of that individual's recall and memory um, as opposed to having the team member jump in with responses. During the meeting, the facilitator is taking notes using the patient's own words to describe what their care plan will be for those first few weeks at home. We go through all of the domains of care that could be affected by the spinal cord injury, specifically related to that individual. We talk about the signs and symptoms or what we actually call the worst case scenarios. So these are things like, what are you going to do if you fall? What are you going to do if you um, have signs or symptoms of a bladder infection? Um, if your bowels stop working the way that they had been previously? And then what are you going to do in those situations? So it's really about problem solving and getting that individual to take the information that they have learned in rehab and try to extrapolate to different situations when they're at home. So we're really trying to create people who are problem solvers because we know that we will never relay every piece of information to that individual before they leave. The last thing that is part of this document is an individualized contact list. So all of the healthcare providers, both in the hospital and in the community that the individual has been working with are part of that contact list. That person is given all of the, the document with the care plan, signs and symptoms, and the individualized contact list. It's both in their electronic patient record, which we have just moved to Epic, and it's also provided uh, in a hard copy format. It goes into their patient education binder so that they have it when they go home. We tell patients to call us when they go home. If they got any questions or concerns, we're here for them. These are the numbers that you can phone. So the aim of Teach Back SCI pods is really to consolidate rehab learning. It is to take everything that a patient has learned during their course of rehab and try to implement it into their home environment, getting them to speak aloud what they have learned um, also helps us to identify any sort of outstanding needs that that individual has before discharge. In this case, we have often identified that equipment hasn't been ordered or it has been ordered but won't be delivered. We've identified that people don't have a plan 
in place if they are to get a, a UTI or bladder infection when they're at home. We've actually been able to identify some patients that don't even have a primary care physician. So we're able to then loop that information back to the individual's care team who can follow up with those identified needs. The um, Teach Back SCI reduces anxiety prior to discharge and it enhances self-efficacy. So the individual feels like I've learned so much while I've been here and I can do this. I know that I can go home and I feel better about going home after having this meeting than I did before. So this is what our template looks like. Um, we use this in the meeting. Um, we go through all of the different domains of care with that individual. We don't get the individual to go through all of their different medications because that is done by the pharmacist and the primary care physician. But what we do is talk through how confident an individual is with their medication program when they're at home. So I would ask the question on a scale of zero to 10, zero being not at all comfortable or confident and 10 being completely confident. How confident are you that you'll be able to manage all of your medications when you get home? That scale from zero to 10, as we know, anything from seven and above is, is pretty good confidence and um, somebody will be able to self-manage. Seven and below indicates poor self-management and we want to then follow up. So again, we would go back to the um, pharmacist and doctor and have them uh, have a follow-up conversation with that individual. The signs and symptoms are all of the different areas that can be customized. So we have listed all of them on the template, but the individual likely won't have all of those signs and symptoms. It is uh, incumbent upon the facilitator, their knowledge of spinal cord injury and what they have learned in the care plan to then customize the signs and symptoms based on the individual that's in front of them. And then we've got the contact list and then any notes or questions that the individual presents. We have just gone to EPIC. We're a, a a just about a year, I think, uh, into the EPIC electric, electronic documentation world. And so we have created our own template in EPIC where the facilitator can pull up the template in EPIC, fill it out within the electronic patient record, uh, and then the patient gets it through their portal. We also will print a copy of this out and um, then they will have a hard copy just because we know not everybody is comfortable with the electronic patient record and sometimes it's hard for people to navigate that world. So we want people to have the information as readily available as possible. So the current state of Teach Back SCI uh, we have had full implementation since 2015. So that's a pretty good track record given it's 2023. It is a standard of care for all patients. We have about a 97% completion rate of all patients in the hospital. There are some people who will not go through a pods. It's not mandatory, but it is part of the rehab program. Some people who discharge AMA, uh, some people um, who are going to um, back to repatriate back into an acute care hospital may not have this. Um, some people who are discharged really quickly and we just can't get our uh, facilitator together to do the pods. So there are some cases that that not all patients would have pods, but 97% of them do. We have seven trained neutral facilitators. So I take all of the facilitators through a four hour um, education and coaching session on how to be a neutral facilitator. All of our allied health clinicians participate as the team member in the, the pods meeting. We have two folks who schedule uh, pods meetings in addition to their regular jobs. Uh, it doesn't take much time. It's about half an hour a week. We have done this program as a resource neutral, no additional cost program. Uh, it has been completely embedded and embraced by the program. It is seen as a value add for that individual patient. And we have received significant feedback from patients and staff 
patients often say, I feel like I'm ready to go home now. And staff will say, I'm so surprised he could articulate what he needs to do at home. We'll often have staff come to me as a facilitator and say, now be ready. He doesn't know anything or she doesn't know anything about what's going on related to X, Y, or Z. Just be prepared. They don't, they're not going to say anything. And we'll go through pods. And as the skilled neutral facilitator, I'm actually able to pull things out. And the staff will come to me after the meeting and say, I can't believe that he knows all that stuff. I had no idea that, that he actually had learned that stuff. So really, it's an excellent tool for clinicians to validate their teaching strategies, their education of patients, and the clinical care that they, that they provide to the patient. But it's also a really great tool to help the patients uh, feel like they're ready to go home. <laughs> so the biggest, this is one of my favorite quotes, uh, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it happened. We all think that because we told somebody something, they're immediately going to retain it in the exact way that we had intended. And we know that that's not the case. We also know that in rehab, after spinal cord injury, with that cloud of crisis over top of that person, trying to remember and retain everything that we're teaching them for the very first time is going to be very, very difficult. And so that's why uh, when we look at a learning pyramid, we know that lecturing is about 5%. I am under no illusion that after this half an hour presentation today, you might retain 10 to 15% of what I have talked about today, which is why I'm going to give you my email address and you can follow up with me. But if I was to ask you to teach other people what you have learned during this session, your learning retention goes up to 90%. That is the foundation of Teachback. So Teachback is evidence-based. Um, and I think the important thing to really know about Teachback is that it's done in a non-shaming way, that we're asking that individual to teach you back what they have learned in your session. It is not a test of the patient's ability to learn, but rather it is a test or uh, um, evaluation of your ability to teach. I'm going to say that again. It is not a test of the patient's ability to learn. It is a test of your, your ability to teach. So if you have not taught that individual the information that they need, they're not able to teach you back. That is a reflection of you as a clinician, and it's your responsibility to ensure that that person has the information that they need. We often assume that, that just because we have said something that the, the listener is going to take up that information, and we know that that's not true. So our job is to use teach back to check for understanding, and if necessary, to reteach that information. So Teach Back is heavily backed by research. We know that 98% of medical errors are communication related. We know that serious safety events are often caused by communication errors. So if there is something that we can do as a healthcare provider to stop those medical errors and to stop those serious safety events from happening in the first place by using TeachBack, our patients get the information that they need in order to live successfully in the community and to continue to live well with spinal cord injury. Now, these quotes um, are old, the, the literature is old in these quotes, and I completely embrace that. However, um, know that these quotes stand the test of time. And if you think about your own environment that you work in, um, I'm sure that you will appreciate that we have a really um, hard time uh, making sure that our communication is as effective as possible. So what is teach back? So this loop explains the different steps that you will take as a clinician explaining a concept to a patient. And I often coach staff who are just starting to learn teach back to pick one, one small thing in their session with that patient that they want to be able to do teach back with because you need 
time to practice this skill as well. So you're going to add the new concept, health information advice or change management strategy for that patient. You're going to explain it to that individual. And then you're going to ask that individual to recall what they have heard you say to validate your ability to teach. If that individual is not able to recall or comprehend what you have taught them, you will reteach, you will tailor the explanation based on the gaps in what the person said, um, what you heard them uh, omit from their teach back. You will reteach that, you will then ask for teach back again, and then you will go on to the next topic. So one of the things that I often coach clinicians here um, is something like fall prevention strategy. So if somebody is moving, uh, is on a, is using a wheelchair and they're just learning transfers into bed um, back and forth, and they're moving to that level of independence where a nurse or clinician may not be around for that transfer, one of the biggest things we know that can contribute to falls is not using the wheel, the brakes on the chair and not positioning the wheelchair in the right way. So those would be the concepts that you would want to uh, apply teach back to and have the patient teach back those elements so that you know that they're safe. So what we're doing is trying to reduce those safety incidences. And then as you become more proficient in teach back, you can start to embed teach back into all of what you do so that the patient retains that information and you know you have taught effectively. So here's some ways that you can use teach back in your own practice. It's my responsibility to ensure you have the information you need. Can you please tell me what you understand or what you've learned so that I can be sure I gave you the information you need? So you as the clinician are taking responsibility for educating your patients by saying, it's my responsibility to make sure you have what you need. By asking you to tell me back, I'm making sure that I've given you everything that you need. Whew. Another way is to say that was a lot of information. When your partner, son, daughter comes in this evening, what will you tell them about the changes we made to your blood pressure medication today? You can fill in blood pressure medication for anything that you've been working on with them. But it's, again, a really easy way to embed that into your conversation with the patient. Another one is we've gone over a lot of information today. So acknowledge that what you're doing is giving a lot of information to that individual and, and that it can be overwhelming. In your own words, tell me what we talked about and then come back to taking responsibility. It's my responsibility to make sure that you've got what you need. Tell me what you've heard today. So these are some ways that you can start to practice embedding teach back into your own uh, professional practice. Then, of course, we need to document that teach back happened. And so really thinking about how do you use documentation to your advantage, recognizing that you have used teach back with that patient. So what you might want to say is, in your documentation, by using teach back, the patient was able to state the steps of the transfer and demonstrate correct positioning, as opposed to IC education provided, transfer training provided. By saying transfer training provided or IC education provided, the person who's coming after you has no awareness or understanding of whether that person has received that information. I see education provided simply talks about the provider. It doesn't talk about the patient. And we know that we need that patient to have that information. And by using and demonstrating teach back in their chart and in the session, there is evidence that the patient has been able to teach back what you have taught them. So that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. I wanna thank everybody for um, your hopefully uh, listening and uh, I'm going to stop sharing, uh, hopefully, maybe. Uh, pause share.
That's perfect, actually, because <laughs> okay. there's a lot of questions for you. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, I can't escape out of there, so we'll just leave it as it is. And I can't see the chat, so maybe you could uh, help yeah, me along sure. there. Um, okay. The first one from Rebecca says, uh, where does this document get filed in EPIC and can the patient and family doctor, et cetera, access it easily? Yes. So it gets put into progress notes um, into uh, the patient's um, electronic patient record. And so it says right at the top of it that it's uh, teach back SCI. So whoever is going in can find the, that um, quite easily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly is asking, do you connect with, or sorry, do you connect the patient with home care contacts as well? Yes, we do. Absolutely. They are all part of the contact list. And um, just like in Alberta, we've got Spinal Cord Injury Ontario here. So those contact numbers, whether it's peer support, um, community um, support worker, um, uh, advocacy, whoever it is, that all of those numbers get added as well as home care. Uh, Aaron is asking, how long is each meeting? Do you mm. hold these meetings for all patients, um, even patients being discharged to a care facility or just the patients being discharged home? So the average time for a pods meeting is 45 minutes that can I have done a pods that's as short as 15 minutes for somebody who's very complete ambulator and very independent, it could be 15 minutes because we just don't need to ask all of the questions. On average 45 minutes. Um, and yes, we do them for everybody. So we have had people who have gone gone to long term care. Um, we have had people who have been returning um, as a ward of the state. So somebody who's a um, under police arrest and going to jail, we've done it with them as well because everybody needs to be able to self-manage. Everybody needs to know what their care plan is, whether it's for themselves direct um, to be able to care for themselves or if it's directing somebody else how to care for me. So everybody needs that, that information and they need to be able to self-manage. Um, the next one is, do you use any specific technique like motivational interviewing? Yeah, so motivational interviewing is one of the foundations for teach back. Um, we use open ended inquiry, reflective listening and empathy, which are core uh, MI skills as a facilitator. Uh, Marcy's asking what kind of education binder do you give at discharge that you mentioned this document goes into for the patient? Yes. So here at Lindhurst, we have our own homegrown patient education tool. It's called Spinal Cord Essentials. Um, it is all online and I am like absolutely thrilled to report that as of today, it's back up online. We had, uh, we had it hacked in October and so Spinal Cord Essentials has been offline since October. But if you now Google spinalcordessentials.ca, you'll find all of our handouts. They come in multiple languages. Um, so the binder is the um, paper copy of all of that. Every patient gets a base binder, which is just some general information that everybody needs to know. And then as the individual goes through their rehab program, clinicians add handouts based on the care needs of that particular patient. So by the time they're discharged, they have a completely customizable binder and education based on their care needs. Um, I'm just going to mention Rebecca's comment. She just said uh, she's so happy to see spinal cord essentials.ca working again because <laughs> we use this resource so often. Yes, we're pretty happy to. <laughs> um, who will be going over this with patient uh, or their family, nurses or navigator? Uh, who goes over? Who what? will be going over this with the patient, it says? Uh, um, nurses or a navigator? So if it's the pods, the teach back SCI, it's the facilitator who, who does the meeting and then takes the hard copy to the patient and will review um, in, you know, what has been said. And it should not be a surprise because everything we have written is in the patient's words. If it's the binder that you're referring to, um, it's all team members responsibility to review the binder with the patient. Uh, Hope is asking, have you validated this for different groups since it was first developed? So here at Lindhurst, we only have spinal cord injury. 
Um, and so it is completely validated here, but I can tell you that pods in some uh, formats has been rolled out to brain, stroke, amputee, mental health, um, children's health. Um, it's pretty much across the province here in Ontario. Um, and I'm more than happy to connect you with the person who has helped spread that across Ontario. That That's not me. Um, I have helped spread pods to different spinal cord injury rehab centers. Um, I went out to um, Vancouver GF Strong for five days and helped them set up their uh, patient-oriented discharge strategy uh, in Vancouver and doing some work with Ottawa as well. So um, Elizabeth says, I think this is a great idea and hopefully the majority um, of the experiences with pods are positive. What do you do in cases where patients slash their families are deemed not prepared for discharge after pods? Do you give extensions on length of stay to address gaps? Uh, do you ever have to change a discharge location due to inefficient supports identified? Does pods ever increase anxieties related to discharge? Even those, are, those are great questions. Thank you so much for, for asking those very difficult questions. Um, so with, thankfully, pods has not delayed anybody's discharge. Um, we have been able to flag serious concerns that the team has been able to respond to very quickly and very appropriately to ensure that that discharge date is maintained. Um, and then if, if resources are required for that individual, the team um, jumps right in and, and makes sure that that things are in place so that when that individual is discharged within the week that they have everything that they need. Um, does it trigger anything for some people? Yeah, it does. Um, we have had a few cases where the individual has um, ended up here at Lindhurst as a result of trying to take their own life. And there has been some significant triggers for that individual. And in that case, we've actually had the psychologist who's been working quite heavily with that individual to be the facilitator for PODs. Um, because they know what triggers that individual and they know where to go and how to maneuver the conversation. The facilitator will be there to take notes so that the psychologist doesn't have to do that. Um, but then in other cases, myself or another um, highly skilled facilitator, you guys probably know Heather Flett as the advanced practice leader. Um, her and I will do the very difficult pods and we will spend time with many different team members to get a more fulsome story of who that person is before the meeting so that we have an idea what the red flags are for that individual and we can be very sensitive to the way that we ask and engage with that individual. Did I miss any questions in that? There was lots of really great ones there. Yeah, <laughs> um, change in discharge location due to inefficient supports identified. No, no, no discharge locations have been changed. Um, okay, the next one. Do you find that the teach back loop can be time consuming if there are many gaps? Do you fill the gaps immediately during the meeting or give that back to the treating team members? Um, so. In most cases, the, the meeting is about 45 minutes. If you're talking about the teach back within the context of pods, um, there have been a few times that, that it takes a while to pull that information out of that individual and, and we need to go back and kind of try and sort that out. But if gaps are identified within the teach back meeting, it is up to the clinician whose domain that falls under to reteach and re-educate that patient outside of the pods meeting. So we're quite adamant that pods is not a place to teach. Pods is a place to identify gaps and opportunities. And we will send those gaps back to the team to address in their um, clinical time with that patient. If you're talking about does teach back in itself in my one-to-one -one clinical intervention uh, take time? If it does, that's a reflection on you as an educator. 
And if you're finding that when you, let's say you're a physiotherapist, um, if you're finding that when you're doing teach back, you're constantly finding that that patient in front of you is not able to teach back, then I think it's time for you to have some really good self-talk and think about what your skill set is as an educator and what assistance, guidance, or coaching do you need to make you a better educator so that when it comes time to doing teach back with that individual patient, they are able to teach back. And that's one of the roles that I have here at Lindhurst is working one-on-one with clinicians to make them an excellent educator. Um, I just kind of, I just rolled down to the bottom and when Hope was asking about um, uh, whether you validated it for different groups, she was talking specifically about uh, Indigenous communities. Oh, thank you. Um, so, before. yeah, no, that's a great clarification. Um, so we have, ha- we don't have as many Indigenous folks here at in Lindhurst as you might in Alberta. Um, But when we take a a client-centered approach and we're asking people to teach back what they know about something, it's it's a very universal process. I would be really curious to work with you guys on on what teach back SCI might look like with an Indigenous population. Um, and, And if a collectivist perspective might be Uh, more advantageous than an individual perspective. So does that individual patient um, want or need members um, of their social network part of the meeting so that there's more supports around them when they go home? We don't, we don't have um, that, that population here in Toronto. Thank you for that clarifying question though. I love that. No, I think that's interesting. Um, what experience slash training is involved in becoming a highly skilled navigator? So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you're talking about a facilitator. Um, and so if it's the pods facilitator, it's four hours of education with me. Um, and so we go through the background of pods, why we're doing it, the rationale, um, the template, and then um, we get I get that individual to um, go through as a facilitator what they would do. We talk through. I have a full 10-page facilitator guide, so I get people to go through that facilitator guide where there's prompts and suggested questions, so we go through that facilitator guide. I get people to practice saying things because sometimes the language or the words are new coming out of their mouth, Um, and then we get somebody to actually facilitate a meeting with me, I as the patient, and I kind of throw some curveballs at them to see how they do. And then we get them to do a pods with me in attendance so that I can give them some real time feedback. And then based on how that person, the new facilitator is feeling and how I'm faci- and how I'm feeling with their uh, proficiency, then we release them into the world or go back and reteach. I have a question based on that, are the yeah. facilitators, um, is it multidisciplinary? It is. Yes, we have OT, PT, SLP, assistive technology, service coordinators, inpatient and outpatient. We've had a nurse. Um, yeah, so it's definitely multidisciplinary. Um, Leonie is asking, uh, do you do teach back with caregivers slash family if they're going to be the response, if, sorry, if they're going to be responsible for care or is it only with the patient? No, absolutely. I mean, that's the critical part, right? If the family or, or caregiver uh, is going to be working quite closely with that patient at home, we want that care provider, that family member to be able to teach back what they have learned here in the program as well. So absolutely, it's critical to have those sorts of people at the meeting and have them participate as appropriate, definitely. Great. Um, Sandra, I think that's all the questions. There are Great. Tons, tons of thank you so much. Great oh, presentation. Thank you. As uh, we have a lot of clinicians um, participating today, I think, that's very 
um, interesting to all of us. So thank Great. you so much. I'm I'm more than welcome to uh, to take questions. Um, my email is sandra.mills at uhn.ca. By all means, send me an email and and uh, I I'll help wherever I can. Awesome. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everybody. You too. Bye.